Happy Palm Sunday to all you out there, my favorite Sunday of the year. I wanna thank all of you for joining me for our Sunday School lesson this week. We're in our Sunday School lesson this week. We take a look at the crucifixion of Jesus. We answer the question as to why. We answer the question to why Jesus died. We answer the question to why Jesus had to give his life for us. Our Sunday School lesson this week being taught there from the 23rd chapter of Luke's gospel from the 33rd through the 49th verse. We'll see that our lesson, it opens up today there in the 33rd verse. Well, Jesus, he is being crucified. He's being crucified between two criminals at a place called Calvary. Now in the other gospels, we won't see the name Calvary. We'll see the name Golgotha mentioned there. Golgotha, it was a place that sat right outside the walls of Jerusalem. It was a hill. And so everyone who was entering into Jerusalem or everyone who was leaving Jerusalem at that time, they would have been able to look up at the hill and they would have been able to see the crucifixion. They would have seen the crucifixion of Jesus and the two criminals that he hung between. They would have seen what was ultimately a humiliating crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus' crucifixion, it was very humiliating. We'll see there again in the 34th verse, that Jesus, his garments were divided and they were gambled over, we're told there. We're told that the rulers, that they mocked how Jesus had saved others and they mocked that he should save himself if he really was Christ. That was the religious leaders. That was the religious leaders that were saying that. We'll see there that even the soldiers, they mocked Jesus. They mocked him with sour wine as he hung on the cross. And then Pilate had an inscription hung over his head saying, this is the king of the Jews, which the religious leaders, when they saw the inscription hanging on the cross, they said to Pilate, don't hang that inscription, hang, hang words that said he said he was the king of the Jews. So even while he was hanging on the cross, we see where the religious leaders, we see where they despised him. We see how greatly they despised him in that he was hanging on the cross as a criminal and they were then mocking him. They were making jokes at his expense, at his death. So the Roman crucifixion, it was made to, to be that. It was made to be humiliating. It was made to be a mockery of those who had led a rebellion or who had thought that they could raise themselves up against the empire of Rome, which Jesus, he did none of those things. We know the story very well. Pilate he didn't find any fault in Jesus, but the religious leaders and those people who they had stirred up in the crowd, they desired for the death of Jesus. Now we'll see there in the 34th verse that to all of what was going on, to, to him dying on the cross, to him being mocked, to him being humiliated on the cross, the 34th verse, if we take a look back at that, We'll see that Jesus, he prayed for the forgiveness of the people as they did not know, they did not understand what it was that they were doing. So what was it that they were doing? Well, the obvious answer to that question would be that they were killing a man, that they were killing, we know, an innocent man. They were executing. They was executing someone who did not deserve to be on the cross. But we must remember that there was something greater in the works, right? We, we must remember that there was more at stake. We must remember that there was more at play than what meets the eyes. And this, it becomes more evident for us as we take a look at the 39th verse, where we're told in that verse that one of the criminals blasphemed Christ, he said to him something along the same line that we saw the religious leaders say there, he said to him, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. Now in Matthew and in Mark's gospel, both of those gospels, they tell us that at one point in time, initially while they're hanging on the cross, that both of the criminals that they reviled, that they ridiculed Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. But over the course of time, while they were hanging there on the cross, one of the thieves began to realize that something was at stake, that something was at work, something greater than, than what meets the eyes, right? One of the criminals realized that this man, 
He isn't supposed to be here. He's not supposed to be hanging on the cross. He's not supposed to be dying in this moment. Jesus, he didn't even put up a fight. This criminal began to realize, you see, again, Barabbas was supposed to be in this place. And in this, this thief, he began to realize that this man, he's hanging in the place of one who should be on the cross, who should be on the cross with him and the other thief. So we'll see there in the 40th verse that the one thief said to the other thief, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? You see, he recognized that they were receiving their due reward. We're told there in the 41st verse, but Jesus, he hadn't did anything that was wrong. I mean, think about it. What was the worst thing that Jesus did? Cure a blind man? You know, cause the blind to see, make the lame walk again, heal those who were sick, raise Lazarus from the dead, raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. What was, what was it that Jesus did that earned him the privilege of hanging on the cross, right? And again, I go back to Pilate who looked at Jesus and said, I don't find any fault in this man. He's not, he's not coming after Rome. He isn't doing anything against Rome. What was the worst that Jesus did? Well, in the religious leader's eyes, they saw Jesus as a blasphemer. And so in the religious leader's eyes, Jesus, he did the worst crime that anyone could commit. He blasphemed the Lord, or at least that's what they believed. Now we'll see there in the 42nd verse, the thief, he turned to Jesus. And I believe in this moment that he recognized all of what Jesus had said about himself to be true. And so he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he said. And Jesus will see, he responded, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so again, something was greater at stake. Something greater was at play, right? And we see that while Jesus was hanging on the cross, that he was doing according to the will of God. He was still serving God's will. What is the will of God? Well, in the fifth chapter of Luke's gospel in the 32nd verse, Jesus said that he came to call the sinner to repentance. Guess what the thief on the cross, guess what he did? In the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, Jesus said, whosoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. Guess what the thief on the cross, guess what he did? He believed. And then again, over in the sixth chapter of Luke's gospel in the 40th verse, Jesus, he said that the will of God, the will that he was carrying out was for that all who see him and believe in him be risen at the last day, having everlasting life in the kingdom of God. So again, the thief who was hanging on the cross, he was saved that day and get this. He didn't have to join the church. He didn't have to be baptized. Again, Jesus said, believe, have faith in me. If you believe in me, if you have in faith, if you have faith in me, you will not perish. You will have everlasting life. Absolutely remarkable that the thief hanging on the cross, all he did was make a confession with his heart. Again, that is what is most important today. Not the profession of faith, but the confession of the soul. That is what is most important for one to be able to have everlasting life in the kingdom of God. Now there in the 44th verse, we will see that there was a noticeable tone shift. Scripture, it tells us there from about the sixth hour to the ninth hour, that's about noon to 3 p.m., that darkness, it fell over the land. We are told there that the sun, it was darkened, meaning that the sky, it was an overcast day began to settle in. It may have started out, you know, being a nice, a sunny day, but around noontime, again, the tone began to shift. It, the skies began to gray. They began to darken. And we're told that the wind even picked up as the veil of the temple, we are told, that we're told there, 
was torn in two. So on the cross, we have to understand that Jesus, he wasn't merely dying a physical death. Again, something greater was at play. And again, he was busy fulfilling the will of God. And again, we know what the will of God is. The will of God is that we have everlasting life in his kingdom, right? And fulfilling the will of God called on Jesus to become our propitiation. That is that Jesus, he was becoming our atonement offering. You see, all of us, we are in need of atoning for our disobedience, for our disobeying the instructions of the Lord. That is what sin is when, when we disobey God's instructions, when we don't live according to the instructions that he has given to us. Some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, what, what are the instructions of God? You know, we'll think about the Ten Commandments. Jesus, he summed it up best. He said that we are to love the Lord with our whole heart. And in that love, we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's the instructions that we are supposed to obey. Yes, we have a commission that we have received from Christ that we should go out and that we should share the good news with all people that, again, we are to testify of the glory of God. But again, our instructions are essentially to love the Lord with our whole heart. And in that love, we ought to move. That are, that, that's the instructions that you should be keeping. That's the instructions that you should follow. And so Jesus, he was becoming our atonement offering for when we don't do that, when, when we move in a manner that says we don't love the Lord. This is why Jesus had to give his life for us because in our nature, our nature is to disobey God. And so God, he has a plan. And you've heard me go over this in my recent Bible study series to where God's plan is to dwell with us. And the only way that he will dwell with us is if we become holy and righteous. And the only way that you and I can become holy and righteous is through our faith in Christ. Jesus, he had to make the pathway possible for us to become holy and righteous. And the only way for that pathway to become possible for us is for our sins to be atoned for. And so he gave his life to make the pathway possible. That same path that I've been preaching about for the past month and a half. Now he made that that pathway possible for us by giving his life for us. He became the lamb for the slaughter to atone for our sins. And so we'll see there as we take a look at the 46th verse that with a loud voice, Jesus, he gave his spirit into the father's hands. Jesus, I want you to understand Jesus. He died a sinner one who was innocent, one who did not know sin, one who was divine. He was holy and righteous. He died a sinner. Those last breaths, typically those last breaths, I want to point this out. Typically our last breaths, they come with great struggle. You know, we, we are taking our last breaths and it may be hard for that last breath to be taken in, in our death. But for Jesus, he cried out with a loud voice, we are told there. Death for him, it was not a struggle. And the reason why death for him was not a struggle was because again, all authority. He has power, he's passed power even over death. He gave his spirit into the father's hand. It wasn't that the father took the spirit from him. He gave his spirit over into the father's hand. And so when the centurion were told there in the fourth and seventh verse, the one that stood guard, when he saw all of this happen, he glorified God, we're told there. He glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. So on that note, I would ask all of you, do you think the will of God was done? Again, take a look at what the centurion said there. The centurion, he glorified the Lord there and he says, certainly this was a righteous man. This centurion, he was a Gentile. He was of Rome. And so again, I would ask all of you, 
Do you think that while Jesus was hanging on the cross, do you think that he fulfilled the will of God? I hope you don't have to think hard about that. Because on the cross, Jesus again, he prayed for the forgiveness of those who were mocking him, those who did not understand what was going on. And then while he was hanging on the cross, he forgave a thief, one who really was a criminal. And he said to the thief, he said to the criminal, that you will be with me in paradise today. And then this Roman centurion, who is watching all of this happen, watching all of this take place. Even he glorifies the Lord there. So I would say to all of you, yes, on the cross, Jesus, he certainly fulfilled the will of God. Even on the cross, while he was dying, he fulfilled the will of God. He fulfilled his whole purpose, the reason why he was manifested in the world was to, yes, shine a light on the truth that all of us are sinners, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, that we need to repent from our wickedness, that we need to heed the rebuke of the Lord, that we need to turn to God, that we need to believe in his only begotten son so that we can become holy and righteous and have everlasting life in his kingdom. He revealed that light to us. He revealed that truth to us. And then even more importantly, he died for our sins. He became our propitiation. He became our atonement offering so that we can find grace in the eyes of God so that we can have the opportunity to enter into his heavenly kingdom. And so we'll see there in the 48th verse that sadly, not all who stood by, who stood witness of, of Jesus hanging on the cross, not all of them believe. We will see that most of the crowd, they performed this religious custom of that day by beating on their breast, by beating their chest. And then they turned around and they left. You see, the show for them, it was all over. The theater, the theater show, it was all over for them. However, Jesus' acquaintances, we're told there in the 49th verse, and the women who followed him throughout his ministry, they watched all that took place. And in John's gospel, he makes it clear that he was the only disciple that was there that was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. So this was a very somber moment for all of those who love Jesus as they watched, they watched someone they love, someone who was a friend. They watched him die a, a mocking death, a humiliating death, one that was very, very gruesome, one that was very agonizing. They watched him die that death on the cross. But again, something greater was at stake. Something greater was at play. And if they realized in that moment that Jesus had fulfilled the calling, his calling, that he had fulfilled the will of God, they would have rejoiced in that moment. Now, of course, that day wasn't for their rejoicing but we know next week when we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, when we celebrate Easter, we know that on the first day of the week that they celebrated, that they rejoiced over the resurrection of Christ. But again, in this moment, there was a very somber tone for them. But again, for us today, we rejoice at the giving of Christ because again, he had to give his life so that all of us who desire not to have our home be in this world and then have an everlasting home that is separate from the Lord, all of us who desire to, to dwell with God for everlasting life, for all of us who desire to live in God's peace and in his joy for everlasting life, this was a moment of victory, a moment of rejoicing because all of our sins, all of our wickedness, when we give in to temptation, all of it was given and put on Christ so that we don't have to suffer a gruesome and an attack and a humiliating and an agonizing death. That death being the second death where we are cast away from the presence of the Lord for all of eternity. Jesus, he gave his life so that none of us have to go through that. 
so that we can enter into the gates of the kingdom of heaven. So we should be grateful. We should be thankful that Christ, that he laid down his life for us. Are you today, are you grateful? Are you thankful that Jesus, that he gave his life for you? Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. As always, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you will take something away from this lesson, that you will apply it to yourself and that you will share it with someone somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our Sunday School lesson next week. Make sure that you're following this channel so that you can get the next notification for next week's Sunday School lesson so that you don't miss it, so that you don't miss the Sunday School lesson, the sermons, the Bible studies, or the Food for Thoughts. Make sure that you're following this channel today.